Thank you very much for coming. So uh, Chris and I and Henry Villarreal, and Henry will be coming in a little bit later. At the beginning of the summer, we attended a basic skills leadership institute. We didn't know what we were getting into at the time. <laughs> but part of it was a pretty much six days. We started on that Sunday afternoon and finished on a Friday at noon. And we went full days so behind in the evening, sometimes then in the evening. There were projects all the time. And one of the projects that we proposed was to expand our reading apprenticeship practices from the math science division to other divisions, and we thought the most likely candidates, social sciences, creative arts, and we really want our counseling faculty to be in with us so we can get our students on with the reading. Uh, so we're happy to have a panel today uh, of uh, a chemist person, Catherine J. Walter, history from Chabot, Kathy Diamond, and Teresa Martin, both from the biology department. And Chris is going to give you a little bit of uh, information of the things we have done in uh, the sciences in collecting data from the students and then Teresa will talk more about that. And uh, after the panel we'll have some time for questions and answers and we're going to have a couple of people uh, from Student Services side of the house, Juan Andrade from the Learning Center and Henry Villarreal, at another event clear across the other side of the campus and building five, but they're both going to come and talk about other the student success initiatives. So the reading apprenticeship is part of that umbrella of reading apprenticeship program. Um, Teresa will probably talk a little bit about, we're going to have a reading apprentices training workshop. So today we're going to show you, you know, things we're doing in the class, but more of what's that's doing in our classes. But on the 22nd of November, there's from 11 to 4 in building 10, we don't have the room yet. We're going to have a full training again for everyone that couldn't attend our Flex Day uh, <coughs> training workshop. That will be another opportunity. I just started in social sciences. Uh, and we always think, you know, there is a parallel with social sciences, psychology, counseling. So I'll make sure that those of you that are not waiting in my email list will get the announcement. So. And thanks, Kevin, the, the social science creative arts division for helping Give yeah, thanks for inviting us. It's like a, this is a good turnout. So, Chris? Oh. All right. So, many of you are probably aware that the uh, Reading Apprenticeship Program is part of a uh, one of several um, student success initiatives that are statewide initiatives. And so, we it was initiated here at the College of San Mateo. And, uh, 2012, and one of the things that we did at the end of the semester was to administer a student survey. And so I think this gets to the idea of what is student success, okay? It means different things to different people, but at the top is the question that was asked in the survey, and then it was the typical um, type of uh, answer where they could choose strongly agree, agree, all the way down to uh, strongly disagree. And I think this one on the right, my participation in reading activities made it easier for me to talk in class about what I understood and what I did not understand about well, the material. Um, I think that gets to one of the points that the practitioners here on the panel are going to talk about, is creating a comfortable and safe environment in the classroom for the students to feel like they can open up and talk. And anybody that's been in a classroom and has asked a question to the class, do you understand what I'm talking about? And nobody raises, or do you, does anybody need this to be clarified? Nobody raises their hand, and so you don't really know what's going on. But here you can see the response, and this is in classes that have had reading apprenticeship, that the response is extremely skewed to the agree side of the, the um, surveys. Um, and then again, it says reading activities help me improve my performance in this class. Now, this doesn't say anything about their actual performance. But it really does address how they felt about it in the classroom, participating in this particular activity. And again, it's very skewed strongly to the, to the left on the agree side. And so these things do get to that idea of making the students comfortable and feel better about what's going on in the classroom. Um, and as many of you are aware, the students that we get at the College of San Mateo are um, placed, 70% of them placed into a basic skills class. And so this, one of the things about um, BASILI, that BSI, that stands for Basic Skills uh, Initiative here. And so this is one of the things that 
we've been, has been addressed here at the college, but also the, um, the students that move on into higher level classes like anatomy or physiology, that they're still the same students, and so they need to be addressed also. This graph, even though it seems a bit complicated, is some of the data we collected last semester, and it, I want to use it just to address a particular point that a lot of people say the reading apprenticeship is too involved and it has a lot of work in, in, when they read the uh, reading apprenticeship textbook. So across the top is our, the classes, the, sec, the classes that use reading apprentice, and this was in the spring of 2013. And these are the different routines or tools, abbreviations that can be used uh, for reading apprenticeship in the classroom. And so you can see there's a lot of these that weren't used in any classrooms. But what I want to point out is a couple of people, you, well, one person in particular, TM, uh, <laughs> used a bunch of different uh, routines in her class. I guess she got halfway through the textbook. To the <laughs> um, and then there are other people, like um, here in this chemistry theory one, where they really focused mainly on one particular tool. So it isn't that you have to use all the tools, but that you can use different ones um, as to what's appropriate in your classroom. <coughs> and so here at the College of San Mateo, we're trying to focus on student success. And I would just like to um, list up here, even though Tanya already said them, the participants in the panel, Catherine Sessla, uh, Jane Walford, Kathy Diamond, and Teresa Martin, are going to try and express a little bit about their experience in the classroom with reading apprenticeship, as opposed to necessarily given actual hard training that is, has been going on um, at this college and in other places. Um, so why don't we start with Catherine and then work our way down. Okay, so hi, I'm Catherine, I'm in the chemistry department. This is my third semester of, uni of using reading apprenticeship. Um, the reason why I was attracted to reading apprenticeship was that I noticed that my students um, were either not doing any reading or when they were reading uh, their text, that they had a very difficult time of comprehending the material. And my efforts to help them usually meant that I was pre-digesting the material for them and breaking it down. And Rather than helping them, in some ways it made them more dependent on me because they were relying on me first interpreting the material before they could understand it. And reading apprenticeship was attractive to me as an instructor because it was more about teaching them skills that they themselves could use to um, engage and interpret the material that was part of the coursework. So. Um, so that's why I became interested in it. And initially, uh, one of the important things of the reading apprenticeship practice is to establish a safe working environment. And I think all of us uh, start off with trying to establish, um, it's called norms or standards of behaviors, where we discuss as a class, you know, what makes a safe learning environment from you. And it was really interesting what the students came back with, because a lot of them said similar things. They wanted to feel that they wouldn't be embarrassed or singled out, um, and that uh, you know there were certain standards that were common to all of the students, and so that's to try and encourage this feeling of we're all in it together, okay? We're all learning together, and that this is a safe place to ask questions. In terms of the techniques that I used um, in the first semester that I did it, I only chose one technique, which was called talking to the text. One of the big issues in chemistry is um, students have a really hard time with what we call word problems, where the problem is you know, in a paragraph of information, and it's very challenging for students to tease out what's the question, what are the important facts. And talking to the text is basically when you read a piece of text and you annotate it with your thoughts and responses, and it can help you organize your work. So I use that, that was the only technique I used in the first semester. Um, in the second semester, I also incorporated reading logs. I don't know if you noticed in the chart, I still was heavily using talking to the text. And then I incorporate, incorporated a thing called reading logs, which is basically I assign um, some reading, and the students have to record uh, what they've read and then their interpretation of what they've read and any questions that they have. 
as a result. Um, this semester, I've also incorporated, uh, it's called Think, Pair, Share, but essentially what it means is I'm allowing time for the students to talk to each other about um, their understanding and how they approach problems. Whereas in the first and second semester, it was really more me talking to the students. Um, so I'm slowly building up what I do in terms of reading apprenticeship. And what I've noticed um, anecdotally in my classroom is that in doing these routines is that the students are much more open. The, um, they're more open to asking questions. They, um, when I introduced the reading logs where they're responsible for doing the reading before coming to class, I noticed that the discussion was much more engaged. Their questions were more informed questions than they, they were previously. Um, and particularly this semester where um, I'm encouraging students to read some text and then share with their neighbor uh, what their understanding of that text is, um, I've noticed that there's much more dialogue between the students themselves. And that actually is really obvious when we do um, lab groups. I notice that students are much more engaged in their lab work and in talking to each other about, well, I don't understand this. How did you solve that? Uh, so it changes a great deal the classroom environment, in my opinion, and how we um, work as a, as a group. In terms of... Um, and the other upside is that students seem more, they feel more competent. So when they feel more competent, they're much more interested in learning the material, I find, because they, they have a level of competence that they may not have had before. In terms of time commitment to uh, reading apprenticeship, because it can seem quite overwhelming, the techniques and how you implement it. Initially, it is an investment of time, but um, I would say it's more a reorganization of your time rather than you have a huge amount of time attached you know, to do something extra. It's, it's more of a, a change in mindset for me and how I approach the classroom. Um, I'm not just handing over content to the students. I'm actually interested <coughs> in how they develop their learning and how they go about learning. Um, so I see it more as a reorganization of my time rather than lots more time spent doing something extra. It also has allowed me to do more of a flipped classroom where I can assign reading and the students can record a reading log and then when they come to class we spend more time going through problems rather than me just delivering the content to the student. Um, I started very slowly and I am a member of a faculty inquiry group which is essentially a teacher support group so it, um, <laughs> it spreads over into things other than RA. Um, but it's a great uh, forum for you know, exchanging ideas on teaching pedagogy and what we're doing in our classroom. So it's, I find it really beneficial for RA, but also just my teaching in general. Um, and yesterday, I just wanted to mention this, that um, I had two students that, I, that were in the same class last fall, and they both dropped for personal reasons, one for health and one for family reasons. And in lab yesterday, two separate labs, um, it's two guys, they came up to me at different times and they said, oh, you know, I asked, how are they getting on? And he said, oh, you know, I've noticed you've changed your teaching methods. And uh, mm. he said, you know, it's really helpful. I understand it a lot more. And the thing that I've changed this semester is the students are working together and talking to each other about how they're approaching the problems. And all. So, I mean, it, that was anecdotal, but it, it meant a lot to me that they felt Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to just go on then? Yes, I, I had sent yeah. Tanya some slides. If you hit B on here and the down arrow, we'll get to the, the Just the B letter? B, yep, letter B. And yeah, no longer be black. Oops, there you go. No down arrow. Oh, there it is. This is not something I'm proud of. All right, it's, it's very hard, hard to share this. Um, I'm Jane Wolford, I'm from Chicago College, and I wanted to thank Tanya for inviting me to be here today. It's really a pleasure to share my classroom experiences with you. Um, fall of 06 was the first year that our institutional researcher actually posted success data um, on our website, and I was just appalled. 
Um, I found that for history, the, the, re the average was about in the 55th percentile. Um, I, it's interesting to me when I saw your number of 70% of your students test into or take basic skills at Chabot, it's 92%. Mm -hmm. So just to, to give you, you know, that's our student population. Um, in my classes, I teach the first part of the U.S. History Survey, and then I also teach U.S. Women's History. So I really do get the cross-section. I have people from all different abilities, um, interests, um, and my classes are, and I've been talking to, to your colleagues, 44 students to 50, um, and I have a, usually have a fairly high dropout rate. So this just kind of shows you, before I began implementing RA, what my success average was. Um, by the time I hit um, follow eight, I, I was just kind of desperate. I couldn't figure out how to get that up. I was feeling somewhat like a failure. I was feeling very, very frustrated. I was putting a lot on myself. And I'm very fortunate at Chabot that we have some real dynamic leaders on our staff. And two of our English faculty, some of you may know if you've attended three CSN events. One is Katie Hearn, some people know Katie, and then Cindy Hicks is also on our staff. So we used to share a bathroom, and um, <laughs> that's where some of the best conversations <laughs> take place between faculty. And I would just talk to people about how frustrated I was, and I really didn't know what to do, and I was trying different things. And so they recruited me into reading apprenticeship, kind of as a last ditch resort. I was willing to try just about anything. Um, and so I, I started with the faculty inquiry group in spring of 09, but I didn't implement it at that point. Um, the thing that convinced me that it was that it might be something that would work was at our second FIG meeting. Um, the FIG leader had said to everybody, bring a one page of text that you assign your students early in the semester. And there were, I think, 10 of us in the group, and so we had to make 10 copies. We were each assigned every week two readings. And then what we did for the first three or four meetings is that the, the expert in the discipline would have to be quiet and listen to all of the other instructors discuss the reading, why they thought it was a sign, why they thought it was important. They decided to do mine first, and they, there was a very rich discussion, and at the end of it, they just looked at me, how did we do? And Because these are the A students, and I looked at them and I said, well, you came up with some really interesting things, some things I hadn't thought of before, but you weren't anywhere near what I wanted you to get out of it. And then they got, well, what? And so when I told them what the purpose was, Katie Hearn looked at me and said, so you wanted us to make an inference. And I just kind of did this. She goes, well, you didn't tell us that's what you wanted us to do. In fact, you didn't really tell us what you wanted to do at all. So we just kind of, and it really kind of dawned on me that I really was not telling students what I wanted them to do. I was giving them reading. I was giving them study questions, but I really wasn't giving them purpose when they when they were reading. So I just wanted to show you, um, this has been since I've implemented. So I began implementing in fall of nine, and these are my numbers through spring um, 13, um, and then my average success, I've had a bump up of about 8%. Um, that 62.9 is still not something I'm real proud of. Um, I would love to get it somewhere up into the 70th percentile. I don't know how realistic that is, uh, but I still feel like there's more that I could do. What I like about the chart is that it shows you that reading apprenticeship while helpful is not a magic bullet. Because when I look at last year, fall 12 and spring 13, they just took a nosedive for reasons I did not really understand because I was doing the same things and I was working just as hard. And I think we all know that as instructors, sometimes you just have those semesters that just aren't real explainable. Why one group does really well, and then the same instruction, and the other. And so I just had groups that brought the average way down. So um, what I wanted to do is just share with you a couple of things that I do in my history class. One of the first things I did after I saw how people were responding to my reading is I threw away the history textbook. I don't use it anymore. Um, I really defy anyone to show me what's interesting about a history textbook, and I'm a historian, and I find them just boring as hell. So I got rid of that, and I spent several summers, and I came up with custom readers. So now I give custom readers to my students. Um, this is the one that I use for U.S. Women's History, and then this is the one for the, what we call History 7, which is U.S. History Through Reconstruction, and it's a collection of primary sources, which 
su surprised me, they actually now enjoy primary sources because I do a lot of scaffolding with them, using to me that they really like it. Uh, one of the things is we use it a lot more than we ever use the textbook, and it's a whole lot cheaper. This one's 30, and this one's 50. All right, so I, I just look at them and say, no excuse about buying the textbook. You're, your uh, cell phone bills are higher than this, all right? So I just say, show me your cell phones, and then I'd say that so nobody gets to use, I can't afford the textbook, because this is a very low cost way. Um, I have note takers in here, I have all sorts of things, a lot of their homework they just rip out and give to me, so it necessitates them buying it, and it doesn't do them any good to buy a used copy, because the homework sheets are all used up. So I, I found this is a pretty good solution, it's not a panacea, but I, I think this works a lot better. Um, I wanted to show you one of the more successful things that I do, and I know Tanya has told me I don't have time to actually do it with you, but in the packet that, that Chris handed out to you, if you turn to the second page, um, this is a reading from my text about Harriet Tubman. I used to lecture about Harriet Tubman, uh, and now I don't anymore. Uh, now we read about her, and we do a think-pair-share based on this reading, Students talk to each other about Harriet Tubman, and I really find that when I do an assessment, they do so much better um, on this particular subject than they ever did with me standing up there telling me what I knew about her. So what we do um, is we use this in conjunction with the next page. And the next page has been, I think, really a saving grace and I think is largely responsible for the bump up. Um, this is my version of a metacognitive law. Uh, what I like about it is that you can um, change this to suit any discipline. Um, I've seen people use this in the sciences. I've seen people use this with literature. Um, you just need to plug in your own things. And so what I usually do with them through about the first half of the course is I help, We do, as, a, as a large class, we'll go through uh, the first top of it. So we agree on title, author, genre, we decide on a focus question, the thing that I want them to look for, which they say is phenomenally helpful, knowing in advance what I want them to look for. And then it's a great way for history students to source a document and place it in historical context. Um, before that, I honestly just expected them to know how to do that. And this process shows me that they don't at all, all right? And when I help them with this, toward the end of the semester, I give homework assignments where I just give them the blank sheet and say, go do it. All right, and then I, I see what their progress has been. What's so nice about this is that students can actually tell me what they don't know. If you flip back to the front side of the Harriet Tubman page, the first question I often get <coughs> is what the C means next to the date. Again, something that I just kind of thought was standard knowledge. And what's really nice about that is I always have those few who will go circa, and it means around. So it's a nice way for students to help other students. Um, and then we also look at the fact that um, it wasn't written by her. When I say who's the author, and they immediately want to say Harriet Tubman, and I'm going to say, now, now you always, standard rule in history text, read the intro. It gives you a lot of info. They used to not read an intro. They would dive right into the text, and it would just really hurt their understanding of it. And then we figure out that it's based on interviews that was, were written by New England abolitionists. So then that gets into the question, so is this a primary text or is it a secondary text? So it really allows me to do a lot of kind of scaffolding with them that I never did before because honestly, for 20 years, I just assumed that, this, that college history students were coming into me because they'd taken it for two years in eighth grade and 11th grade and I just kind of thought they knew this. This log has really helped identify for me what they don't know, all right, so that I can help them before we move into it. And so once we've done all of, the, filled in all the top together, then I do what you do, I th do a think pair share, and I put this up there, and I give them the task. So what they do is they have to read the text from the biography, and I want them to list um, personal or situational factors that contributed to her efficacy as a conductor. So I want them to list out the things that either she had or the situation surrounding her that made her so effective. And then in the second column with the meaning, tell me why you put that there, all right? If you put something in there, how, how in what way do you think that helped her? 
And then there's a question column. If you don't understand vocabulary or you think it belongs there, but you're not really sure why, and I give them about 15 minutes to pair and talk about it. And then as a whole group, we make a list on the board of what belongs in the column and what doesn't. And I find that this is a much more effective way. Uh, Harriet was a very spiritual woman. And so uh, for a lot of my students, they talk about how their faith has helped them through very difficult times. And it really gives them a, a lot more context than if I just looked at them and said she was a very spiritual woman. So it's something they could make personal, all right? Um, and it does allow a lot of discussion in the class, and they're much more likely to talk about what they don't know to each other than express that to the larger group where they feel a little more intimidated. So this is primarily what I do with the primary text that I give them, and believe it or not, students actually like it. Um, they feel the time is well spent, and by the end of the semester, I'm giving them really difficult documents, manifestos from the second wave of the women's movement, they are really tough documents. And at the end, they hand them in, and they're always thrilled by the fact that they can do this now. They can actually figure out context, they know how to source a document, and they're able to pull what's important out and then give it meaning. So, I know I'm kind of real. I, I use other things as well with reading apprenticeship. I just wanted to give you the thing that for me, I use um, capturing your reading process is an, another thing I use at the beginning of the semester. Um, and I also do some think aloud modeling with an Abigail Adams letter that's very hard for them to understand. And it comes at the beginning of the semester. And I go through a line by line read and I explain to them how a historian approaches a document. And so that letter, which at first they thought was kind of boring and disengaging, they really, it, it kind of makes the hair on the back of their neck stand up, all right? When they kind of read about what she's demanding of her husband, John, and then his answer is, I just think what you want is really funny, all right? And that, and that just gets students, and before they weren't getting that. So there's, a, and I really like the, what, what you put about, there's a lot of different strategies but you really can't pick and choose what works, and I've tried a lot. The log and the think, pair, share work best for me in my history classes, but there might be other things that work a lot better for you in your discipline, or maybe you teach social science classes in a little bit different way. Are we holding questions for the end? Not yet. Yeah, for, for the, the end. end. For the end, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just, if I go one down, this goes to the next. To the right, and then the next oh, I'm Kathy Diamond, and I teach biology here at College of San Mateo. I can't sit down because I'm just not that kind of person, but I also don't want to right in my eyes. So um, what I want to do is compare my classroom uh, reading apprenticeship efforts last year with this year. And the take-home lesson from this is that old dogs can learn new tricks <laughs> if they get lots of practice and treats. <laughs> so my first uh, year RA efforts were the result of a three-day summer workshop that I attended uh, at West Ed with uh, other CSM faculty. And the workshop made me very excited about the potential of reading apprenticeship, as well as giving me tools to try, which you've been hearing about some of these tools. But I lacked confidence in my ability to lead RA activities. And I did not accept myself as an expert reader in my field, which is the premise of RA. You're an expert reader in your field. It's like, oh my god. Um, so my efforts last year were kind of tentative. Um, and so in the, I started in the second week of classes by introducing the metacognitive, or what I just simply call reading logs, to my uh, general biology class, Bio 110. Um, having students practice, then share with a partner and discuss with the class. So when everyone says think, pair, share, I generally say practice, share with a partner, discuss. <laughs> um, uh, and then with only a little bit more intervention on my part during the whole semester, students were kind of left to, on their own, do a reading log every week for homework. Um, and the thing that really kept me trying and uh, working on uh, reading apprenticeship regularly was the faculty inquiry group. That is the hugely important element, is the FIG. Um, getting ideas from colleagues and getting feedback on your efforts and sort of feeling like, oh, maybe that isn't such a stupid idea after all. 
um, and getting ideas from them and getting ideas from Reading for Understanding, which is the most useful nonfiction book I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Generally read Dickens and novels, like I gobbled them up like chocolate, but this is actually useful. Um, that's why I'm not such an expert reader in my field, but. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I started trying some, some RA methods in my cell biology class, which, in which I had not formally introduced RA at the beginning. So I tried a few things uh, with them. Um, I was unconvinced about the process of data collection that we were using, and I didn't give my students a pre-RA experience a survey, which Teresa will tell you about, the Marcy. And so then I figured, well, I better not give them the post survey either. So I kind of opted out on the, the, the data collection, just due to my own doubts. Um, toward the end of the year, I realized that students in my classes were getting better at their reading logs, even though I wasn't kind of helping them with it and giving them practice and so on, and also being late in grading and getting stuff back to them for just feedback grading-wise. Um, but somehow, they were getting better at it. And so um, just having to do it every week made them kind of go, oh, I guess I might as well pay attention and get something out of this instead of just sort of shining it on every week. So now this is my second year uh, of reading apprenticeship, and I've gone to a second summer workshop, also with colleagues um, from CSM. And this time I started off in the very first week uh, of class, so oh, not quite ready yet. I don't, I don't want to overwhelm you with the, the second week of class. Yet. So in the first week I began with some simple introductory RA uh, techniques, the norms that um, Catherine told you about, and a little think aloud or talk to the text without really addressing um, the strategies, but just kind of practicing a little bit. Um, and I introduced reading apprenticeship both into my general biology class, Bio 110, and also into cell biology right from the very, very first week. And then in the second week, I led a very intensive uh, RA training session in, in my classes. And so this is, this is a sort of a little, um, <laughs> This, if you follow this down, it, it shows you the sequence, and I, I don't want to scare you or anything, but so I started out, students brought in non-biology literature, and I just played around with, it's, it's really think aloud, but talk to the text and think aloud are the same thing, it's just whether you're talking out loud or writing stuff down, but um, students brought books, non-biology stuff, and I showed them, oh, uh, how I'm trying to figure out what it means. Then, um, then oh, the students started actually looking at strategies. So we have these uh, reading apprenticeship bookmarks, and they tell you, uh, you know, am I predicting, am I visualizing, am I questioning, am I making connections, identifying a problem, and so on. So rather than just let's figure out what this means, it's like, well, what am I doing to figure out what it means? So we started addressing um, strategies. So they were, they were telling me what strategies I had used. Um, and then, um, then they, tried some talk to the text, and I gave them a little short paragraph that's just out of Darwin's um, Origin of Species. It, he was a great writer, but he's hard to read for modern people because his sentences are really, really long. Mm -hmm. Unlike Faulkner, he uses commas, though, so you can tell what's <laughs> going on. But, um, and, and, it, and so it's talk to the text, they're annotating right here along by the text. Then this is the think, pair, share. Share their uh, comments with other students, uh, comments and strategies with their partners in the class discuss it. Um, and we did two practices of talk to the text. Then, we, then I demonstrated the reading logs, and I had them also do two practices with each, and I just use a, a two-column reading log where they take um, something directly from the text, and then they respond to it, their thoughts, their interpretation, their connections, maybe questions. Um, and um, they, they, they um, used, they had already been playing with this talk to the text, so then um, uh, I had them we'll make a reading log from it. And they share those with their partners, and then the class discuss it. Then we did another reading log with another paragraph from Darwin, and they again did it on their own for a few minutes, and they shared with their uh, partners, and then we discussed it um, as a class. And then we actually did a lab, uh, a lab exercise. So, Talk to the text where we're, we're really paying attention to strategies. Couple of times practicing and doing it on their own, then talking to their partner, then the whole class discusses. 
Um, then the reading logs, then two times the students practicing, talking to their partners and sharing it with the class. And finally, uh, uh, a long reading log, um, not long, two pages, a two page essay in their textbook um, uh, for a reading log. And I, I actually tell them, I'd like you to give me at least 10 entries in your reading log. Um, and um, so this is much more preparation than I ever did last semester. And, and, and it was an investment, like Catherine said, it's an investment at the beginning of the semester. So the, the week three and week four, I, we didn't mention reading apprenticeship at all in lab. One was a field trip anyway. And yet they had uh, reading logs as homework. And they will have reading logs as homework every week. But um, I will try as often as possible to, um, I want to have a 10 minute or 15 minute at most little practice. Because that's all it takes, all right? You talk to the text, they spend three minutes talking to the text. Then they spend three minutes sharing with their partner. And then the class can talk about it for five minutes. So it's a short amount of time to make sure everybody's keeping, keeping fresh. Because that's the main thing I learned about this whole thing is you, you need practice and you need the collaboration. The students need to learn from each other and help each other out. Bless you. So lessons from reading apprenticeship pervade my whole course. I give more assignments now with the responsibility shifted to the students for reading about the topics in the text and relating those topics to, to lecture material. And it, unfortunately, it spills over so much, I'm totally reworking all my lectures for cell biology and connecting more with the text. And um, uh, it's, suddenly I'm, I mean, that's nice because it's freshening things up, but it's also getting more in depth um, in, the, in the, the material because they can use the text to, to broaden, uh, broaden their understanding. Uh, and the other thing that happened uh, over the course of last year and this year is I realized that data collection is really needed to make RA valid and college-wide. And the only way for it to be good data is everybody collects it and then we eventually we see what it looks like and then we can consider, oh, how shall we improve this? So this semester, Almost my entire, my two sections of general biology and my cell biology, almost my entire classes, I think of more than 80, 90% or something mm -hmm. of the classes, completed the pre-semester uh, Marcy survey before classes even started. They did it on web access. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm in, I'm doing it, you know. So that's my that's your testimony. Your Testimonial. <laughs> Oh, I forgot, and I wanted to just show you. So here's, uh, here's one of the students talk to the text on this, uh, on this uh, paragraph that looked all clean on the previous one. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing you do. You try to figure out what it means, and they're marking it. That's, that's um, one of their talk to the text. This is the practice reading log, OK? And um, I, they didn't have to talk to the text, but it kind of spilled over. They start to talking to the text when they were just supposed to be doing a little practice reading log. That's just another example of their little practice. Let's just do three quick uh, reading logs and um, there's some more talk to the text. So that's what it kind of looks like when they get down into it. Okay. Here we go. Well, um, you guys have done amazing things and I'm, I am still in my infancy in terms of um, learning how to apply it in my classes. Um, but uh, for me, reading apprenticeship, the key to the reading apprenticeship is um, the metacognitive conversation. And before I took the summer workshop, I didn't know what metacognitive meant. Um, and uh, and um, but what I discovered through reading apprenticeship is that it's really the awareness of um, your processes as you're thinking about um, what you're thinking about when you read. So that little voice inside your head that is always constantly talking to you, you want to capture that and um, use that to your benefit while you're reading. And so I didn't really realize that you could do that when you were reading. I just sort of you know, did my reading, but didn't, wasn't really aware of my own process. And so the reading apprenticeship training really taught me uh, about my own process in reading. And then, in turn, gave me activities that I could do with my students to help them see their own processes and then look at strategies to improve those processes. Um, so uh, for me, that monitoring and that awareness of comprehension is something that I noticed a lot of students were missing in my classes. 
Students would say to me, they come, you know, a student who was very concerned about their grade would come to my office and they would say, I really knew everything that you presented in class, but I failed the test and I, I don't understand why. And, and I said, well, I don't understand why either because you, you know, the, there's a disconnect and over and over. And so um, doing the RA strategy is where students start to talk about their processes, start to see what strategies they use and what strategies they don't use, brings that self-awareness to them. And so one of the um, sort of the, uh, the um, assessments that we, we found through reading apprenticeship and through 3CSN was the Metacognitive Awareness of Reading Strategies Inventory, which is a handout. It's the next page of your handout. We just call it the Marcy. Um, but it's a, an inventory that was developed by um, some researchers at Oklahoma State University. And um, it's uh, this 30 item inventory that asks you about your what you do while you're reading. And so if, uh, if you look at the various questions that they have, um, you start to see it see some, uh, some clues. Oh, I was supposed to have a purpose in mind <laughs> when I was reading. And of course, you know, you, you do that, but you're not necessarily super, it's not exposed, it's not up at the surface. Um, and so one of the um, uses of this is that I gave this, uh, this inventory to my students at the beginning of this semester and asked them to fill it out. And on the back of the handout, there's the um, a tabulation of their answers, and they can fill in their, 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 the numbers that they assigned, and they can score themselves, and they can um, then be assessed as to their, um, their reading skill level, and high, medium, or low. So when they, when they turn this in, as Kathy did, I had it on web access, and the students um, just went to web access and filled it out. And so we can look um, at where they are in terms of what they think about their own reading strategies. And what you notice is that um, in addition to um, this information um, sort of assessing their reading skills, which is really helpful for the instructor to kind of see where they are and see if there are certain strategies that you want to sort of emphasize in your class. Um, it also is the same sort of strategies that are on the bookmarks that we're teaching them about. So we can say, here's the pretest, here's some of the strategies that we're going to be presenting in class to um, encourage you to um, use these strategies to comprehend your reading. And then at the end of the semester, let's see, have we moved the dial? Have, have their strategies increased? Do they have a better number of strategies? And how does that correlate to their comprehension? Reading logs are also something that I use a lot. And they're incredibly enlightening. Over and over in the faculty and great groups, the instructors would say things like, wow. <laughs> you said that too, Jane. Wow, I didn't even realize that you know, the word leather you know, was something, you know, whatever word it is, there's, you take things for granted that you don't realize. And so the practice of reading apprenticeship has really allowed me to interact with my students in a, in a um, deeper way where I can look at their comprehension more closely and then address any deficits I see. And so we can focus in on the things that are hard for the students. And, and as you guys say, it's a chance to kind of flip the classroom a little bit I'm not the content provider anymore. I'm more of the, I'm a content manager, and I am a um, enabler of the student. And so if I feel like if I can empower the students to be better learners, that's going to go well beyond my class. And, um, and so that's you know, my purpose in doing reading apprenticeship. Let's see, if, was there anything else I wanted to say? Um, Oh, and I was doing reading um, from the article that um, was in the Journal of Educational Psychology about the uh, development of this Marcy inventory. And one of um, the sort of the golden lines that I read from, from that article said that um, unskilled readers often don't know that they're missing something. 
they don't know what they don't comprehend. So by having these activities in class, you're helping those students who are less skilled um, uh, realize what they need to do. And so I feel good about you know my skilled students getting something out of it, being um, uh, you finding new strategies that will help them get deeper understanding, but it helps across the board, which I thought is really great. Um, and, um, and it's about your content. So your, your point, your goal is always the same. It's how do we understand what we're presenting in this class so that you can achieve your SLOs. <laughs> yeah. so. Is that your goal? <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, panel, for your <laughs> contributions. Um, this is uh, one uh, before I go on, I want to mention that the Marcy that is on Web Access was courtesy of Cheryl Gregory, who did that for everybody. So it's sort of automated. You can import it into your uh, Web Access page. It's really convenient to, to have the students uh, take that assessment that way. So this is certainly open to um, discussion or questions right now. If anybody has anything about the procedure? Janet? Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say all of your presentations are really compelling, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> couple of basic questions, and one is the faculty inquiry group. How does one join that? Um, in the, uh, Teresa can address this, but on the, in the back of your handout is a little form there. And so those are ongoing. And one of the um, goals of this meeting was to uh, make people aware that the faculty inquiry groups and the schedule is on one of these pages right here. Um, Let's see. Right, here we go. The page here with the list of all the practitioners down at the bottom is the schedule for three of the faculty inquiry groups, the math, science, the reading, and the English. Yeah. And those have, uh, are um, a bit available for you to go visit if you want to visit them. And then there is um, faculty inquiry groups that are, will be forming as the reading season goes on. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have one more question, and that was a talk to the text was mentioned, and is that something that looks like an application of some sort? Yeah, what, what is that? Um, let's see. Oh, it's, a, it's an activity. Get the B and it'll open it up and then use it. Yeah, um, talk to the text is, um, um, that's a, let me go. Yeah, yeah. So right. talk to the text is where you, um, uh, a student spends a few minutes reading a passage and thinking about some possible strategies of how to, how to understand it, and, um, and annotates the text. They annotate the text. That's what talk to the text. Talk to the text is writing, and think aloud is talking. It's very well, On paper, though. Yeah, on paper, paper, yes. Now, think aloud is exactly the same thing. You can do exactly the same thing, but you're do, doing it verbally. Um, and you, and so, so, for example, if you have students working in pairs, and they're doing think aloud, they're talking out loud to each other while they try to interpret the text. If they're doing talk to the text, they're each writing individually, and then they're gonna share what they've written. But in both cases, they're essentially, you know, the author is a person, and the author's trying to communicate to you, and so you're just talking right back to the author. What, what did you mean by that? I know, I, that reminds me of something in class. Whatever it takes to try to make sense of it, and you either say it or you write it. That's what talk to the text is. And interestingly, I don't know if you noticed them on Chris's um, table, last year there's not too much of that, and I didn't use it last year. And then I went to another workshop this year, and then I started thinking about it, and I realized I kind of like it. I didn't like it last year when I first learned about it. I thought, eh, I don't like that. Now I'm thinking it's really a great way to get started. I'm finding my students seem to like, it's a good way to get them, get them going into the reading logs. It's a scaffolding back there. I have a question for Teresa. Mm -hmm. uh, what you said in Treat Me, you said that you're not a content provider anymore, you are a deliverer. And that is yeah, awesome. In a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. And how does that work? Um, so 
again, by having students work together and uh, see each other's processes, um, they can get ideas from one another. And they also listen to each other's stories along the way. So, um, for example, if I'm doing a talk to the text on a, um, a piece of text about how a muscle contracts, and the students are going through um, a sentence and that's very complicated with lots of terminology, and they're saying, oh, I don't understand this. And so they'll mark it with a question mark. And then they'll see what the other person has marked on their talk to the text. And there's a dialogue. And so one student will say, well, I didn't really understand what f filament means. I, don't, I know I go fishing. I, there's fishing filament. That's what I know about a filament. And the other student will say, oh, well, you know, I, you know in my biology class, that I took last semester, we hope they say this, <laughs> uh, filament was in the muscles and it involves, it helps with the muscle contraction. I know it helps with the muscle contraction. So you kind of go through it bit by bit and expose what are you doing to make sense of it. And so sometimes the student will say, well, filament, oh, I just skipped that word and I went on and I figured I'd figure it out after a few more sentences what filament meant back there. So. And then when we listen to the students, we say, that is a great strategy. Reading on past something you don't understand to see if it will come again, surface again and you'll figure out what it means. So you, we're um, encouraging the students to use those strategies that we know work and we know are involved in improved and increased comprehension. So is this done during class time or lab time? Either one, however, you want to structure it. I do it in class time. I, um, I think that um, it, it, to, for me, it feels like it lends it more weight. You know, we're spending class time on this, guys. This is really important. So, and I can control them when they're right in front of me. Um, actually, there's a question over the back. I'm actually pretty new to this thing and uh, impressed with everything that the panelists were presenting in terms of. Uh, this technique improving the student learning. But I can't help but not to ask this question that why not have a class early on in the basic scale that the student participating and someone who's really an expert in this area teach them how to use RA to enhance their learning in all classes instead of putting bits and pieces of this into different classes. Has anyone tried this and what are the pros and cons? Oh. It's called reading. We have class. <laughs> 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 I think the, um, I'll, I'll yeah. answer this, and then I'll let you answer okay. Is that the, the approach of reading apprenticeship is that you do it in the material for that class. You use that as your, as your reading material, as opposed to, you know, just reading in general. Okay. So it's addressing the very content of that, of that subject. And Jane, did you um, answer Yeah, that? well, the comment I was going to make before I asked the question I wanted to ask was that as a lifelong reading instructor, this panel today and others like it that we've had at the college is sort of like if you died and went to wherever you go in a positive place. <laughs> <laughs> that's, this is all what you want. Um, we have a, a reading program here that's very vital. The taxpayers pay for it. It's very appropriate and hopefully it helps students a lot. However, the transfer of that information, historically, I mean, and we have this with basic skills in English and math as well. It's like after they go out, how much of that do they really take? So of course, it's a justified program and we cover that, but we can't give it to every single student. It wouldn't be appropriate. I mean, I guess it's another discussion whether, you know, there might be an orientation for all students, blah, blah. But, the whole research, you guys can correct me, behind reading apprenticeship and what they're finding throughout K-12 and now through colleges and universities is this is where it really grabs hold to the student who's trying to get their BA. You know, it's just like I can give them something and they can do it, but if they're over in Kathy's cell biology class, that's a whole other bottle of, bottle of wax. And it's sort of like we're all doing it in conjunction. So it's a good idea, but the whole theory by re apprenticeship is it needs to be done by every instructor. Yeah. And I keep hearing from our English teachers is that we can't teach them how to read in your discipline. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we can teach them reading skills and strategies, 
But dealing with a primary source document, you're the expert, and so that needs to be reinforced in your class. We're, we're not the people that can fix them, and I think a lot of English teachers feel that that burden has been, that they should fix all reading problems. And I find with my students, they can read, but they just have no clue what they're doing on a, in a history text. Um, I just had a follow-up. I just want to question. Jane, I wanted to ask you about um, on the way you modified one of the documents, the one that you showed called Primary Source mm -hmm. Investigation. I think I just uh, physically didn't hear what you said. You said you had the students write down the meaning of whatever they did. Yes. I, I want to know why they put that, why did they put that passage in there? What does it mean to them? Okay, as, as that's true with the, the way some of the other documents metacognitive. My question was, when you get the whole class together, I thought you said, then we put up on the board what should go there. Well, we put, what, I what, correct, what we put up there what, what the group agreed on. So it's kind of a group agreed list. Of the different meanings. Uh, of the, of the, actually, the different parts of her life that contributed to her success. Okay. Does that make So if, for example, in a small group, they said the meaning of this piece of text is blah, blah, but then the whole group said, well, no, not really. Then okay. That often happens as well. Okay. We, we will argue about meaning and does something belong on the list, and if not, why not? But it tends to be a pretty inclusive list. Very seldom do, you, do I look at a student and say wrong. Okay, that's, that's yeah, wasn't clear. Yeah, so. very seldom. A so right. uh, couple of logistics ones. Uh, do you have any issues about, anybody have any issues? Is, is it always something you print out for yourself and it might be a uh, however long um, or anything out, of, anything out of a book? Because I'm looking at this going, I'm worried about students saying, oh, buy back <laughs> and things like that. Oh, oh, no, we don't have them write in their books. Oh, they write in mine. Mine's a workbook. Yeah, mine. hers is a workbook. Is that a typical, is that a typical length? Well, this is this is when they're learning talk to the text and practicing talk to the text, and that would be about as much as it is. But the reading log homework they have, the reading log is a separate document. They prepare reading from their text. They're not annotating their text. They're reading from their text and preparing a reading log on, on separate sheets. The passage length, though, is generally fairly limited. A couple of pages. Yeah. For a, for a full reading. Yeah. Did you did you actually write this yourself or, or this actually appears in the textbook? Okay, that's a page from two pages from my textbook. Right. Because I, I'm both I see the value in this and I'm kind of excited about it, but I'm also I'm, I'm a content provider and I I freely own up that I lecture here, so I'm looking at this both excited and very scared because I'm I'm definitely an old dog that's looking at a new trick going. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to find out from you how, um, you know, all of my classes are filled up with lecture and then question and answer and, and, and some you know, thought questions with, with voting and big share fairs. How do you flip it around? How do you make the time deciding, how hard was it emotionally to decide what to cut? You know, so I think one of the key things, sorry. No, I think you should answer is that you, know, you want to start small. So the first semester, when I did this, I did it with word problems. So I would take one word problem in class, mm -hmm. we would do, I would do a talk to the text, I'd solve it, and then they would have one that I gave them that they would do, talk to the text on the word problem, and um, so that they would break it down. So you can start very, very small. You don't have to start where you're throwing out all your content and you're trying to do flip classrooms from day one. What I think you find is that as you get more comfortable with it, you start to just build up what you do. It's like what we do in general as teachers, when right? we start to introduce new things. So you, I think that you can get yourself into hot water if you try and do everything at once. Um, and we were kind of, the first semester was pretty baptism of fire. But um, I would start very small and say, do you have, do you find, because I found in examinations I would get blank responses. People didn't even know how to start with some of the word problems. What I found after doing What do you mean by a word problem exactly? So a word problem would be, so say, you know, they have to use an equation and calculate something, but it's, it's a descriptive problem, oh, right? Yeah. So they, they have a hard time knowing, well, what exactly is the question and what value am I supposed to use? And they would say to me afterwards, I know the equation, 
but I just don't know how to answer the problem mm -hmm. because they couldn't read the problem. You know, for a chemist, they would have a hard time identifying what's the reactants and what's the products. Mm -hmm. And the reading, you know, it really was eye-opening to me to realize that for some of them it was at that level. So um, identifying some where small, maybe in lab or um, in start, I think is a good thing. It's a, you know, take it slow, don't put too much pressure on yourself. And I think you also said there were sort yeah, of responses more to efficient. questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So as the semester went on, I found that it's a more efficient use of my time. But at the beginning, I think Kathy, you feel the same, where it is, there is a big investment initially, as you said. But you can do it different ways. Now, I mean, yeah. I do it in lab. I do most of it in lab. But if, if I didn't have lab and I just had lecture, I would do, oh, you know, five minutes a, a, a day in lecture. Five minutes is, I mean, I, as it was, I tried other things related to this that took five minutes out, out of lecture. But you, you, you get paid back because they get the content more readily and you don't have to spend so much time putting that spoon right into their mouth. Um, so you actually, you actually say, you know, it so comes you, out You can do a all these in five minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you <laughs> typical procedure like this, uh, uh, you model for about a minute. In fact, that when we learned how to do this, that, you know, you don't, you know, drive it into the ground. You model for one minute, and then you let them go for three minutes, and then they share with each other for two minutes or three minutes, and then you share with the classroom five minutes. So a little practice, talk to the text kind of thing can take 10 or 12 minutes, and so you know, if you do that once a week or something, it's, it's not a big deal. And then they, start, they do it out of class, because that's what you want. And the reading logs are homework. They do their reading logs as homework completely. And I, I was going to say that, you know, in, when I, prior to d doing reading apprenticeship, I would not assign reading. I said, everything you need to know on the test, I'm going to lecture to you. you. So I was the sole content provider. Because I gave great lectures. <laughs> we all do, right? We give great lectures. But, um, but now, I'm like, well, they know how to read now. Yes. They, I'm going to just assign this reading. Right. And, and they're going to come back, and then we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to help them with their misunderstandings and their misconceptions. And then we're going to move forward. I completely agree with what you're saying. I, I rely a lot more on text now. They wouldn't read their textbook. I just gave up. Yeah. And, and now we do Harriet Tubman with that text. It's not my lecture anymore. Uh, you have the questions are they assigned randomly? Are they permanent, temporary? Whoever you're sitting next to, how do you assign the pairs for the year? I do it whoever they're sitting next to. Whoever they're sitting next mm -hmm. to. Well, I do it in lab, and um, every lab week I assign lab groups. Um, and it's different every week. So I make the students work with, they end up working with every other student in the class um, over the course of the semester. So um, the regional training, uh, are we going to really get down into the nitty gritty on some of these things? Because I know this is kind of an experience, experiential panel, right? And so I think if we're going to learn how to do it, then we need to be at the November 22nd, and we'll be much more hands-on, is my understanding, yeah. right? It's like yes. the workshop we did before classes started. Yeah. I mean, this one's longer. A little bit longer. Right. And so, so you know, there's, there are a fair number of people here who I think are interested, who will go back and encourage more people to come to the November 22nd training, and I, I think that's great. I, I also had a different comment, which was the textbook. I think um, when we look at sell-through rates, in the bookstore, for example. Students try to get through a class without ever buying the textbook. So Jane's strategy here is bringing down the cost, and then they really need to have it in front of them to succeed in class. And I think anything we can do that both helps students afford it, because we, we know they're sometimes choosing between food and their text, um, you know, particularly if it's a $150 textbook, right? Um, but if we can use it, incorporate it in the classroom, they have to they have to have it with them. I mean, it's exciting to see a student come in with the textbook for the class, <laughs> and instead of, well, okay, I'm just gonna deliver the content to them because I can see that two-thirds of them didn't bother reading the 
assigned chapter, so I've got to at least have a common basis to begin yeah. any activity. I think I that's a great there, strategy. I, I've hit, I've hit um, um, copyright issues before. What about if you're making oh, they your do it all? So you go through, I just as university leaders, you just send in copies of what you want and they take care of everything. Yeah, Pearson also does custom oh, readers. Sure. There's I, a lot I of publishers that do that's all. It's and, very, the um, time is, is finding out what you want to put in there, mm -hmm. but they do it for you. I, oh, I also, can I just mention also to segue off of what you said, um, there's also an online course um, that starts September 23rd. It's six weeks long. I think it's 30 hours of training. And uh, people um, have taken it from our campus. Jamie has taken it. And have you found it well, incredibly useful, right? I mean, well, of course, you know, with my training, it, I, I knew most of the stuff. But what was cool is that I took it with the two new reading adjuncts um, that are new to our college that they've been hired for the summer and to start this fall. So they took it along with the two instructional aides in the Reading ESL Center. So two people who ward up the campus and two people who are trained as faculty members. And um, what, just to relay your anxiety, though it's a pretty intense course, and just really excellent. To be honest, I found it more helpful than the training we had a year ago. Um, but um, they are flexible, like, you know, you've got a lot going, the person who leads it knows that. So you say, look, I'm supposed to contact this person in Modesto. Oh, no way. It's not it's gonna happen until next week. That's okay. You know, it's doable is what I'm trying to say. But you I think I'm speaking for the people who took it. They really did feel it was very worthwhile. Yeah, and you really need to get training. You can't yeah. just sort of go, oh, oh that sounds interesting. I guess I'll try some reading apprenticeship. You really need training and more training the better because it's it, the it, person. It, it increases your confidence level and and like you know suddenly a knit technique I hadn't thought was gonna really work now that I got more training it's like oh that, that works better than I thought and the combination of training in the faculty inquiry group is really essential I think to the success of RA. Okay. So let's have one more question maybe Cheryl did you have? This wasn't really a question in talking about having a reading text. So many of our students are going to the e-books and mm -hmm. what I have found and I use this in other words now, is I just tell them beforehand, if I'm going to be doing something in class, we're going to need to have these two pages on paper, please print them and bring them with you. And you can then you don't, because you can't write your ebook. Right. It doesn't work real well. But it, there are okay. ways to work around the fact that some of the students use ebooks. Well, and some of us don't like people. to encourage students writing ebooks. <laughs> well, I'm all for writing your we right right <laughs> Okay, so um, I would like to point out uh, one of the ideas behind this having this co division meeting was that um, people would be invited, if they were interested, to attend, um, drop in on one of the faculty inquiry groups. And also listed here is a list, of, at least a partial list, of people that are practicing reading apprenticeship in their classrooms right now. If you want to contact them, about um, perhaps going to their classroom to watch it in practice. Um, and then there will be on November 22nd the uh, sort of formalized training. And that will be here at the College of San Mateo. Um, so I would encourage anybody that's interested in that to keep their eyes um, open on their emails, et cetera, for the um, invite to that. Oh, it's not listed here? Uh, it's just announced here. Oh, okay. Yes. And, um, if you're interested in the faculty inquiry groups, um, there's a form here to fill out, and probably uh, Teresa Martin would be the person to talk to about that. And I don't want to belabor that point too much, as was already said here, how important that is to participate in the faculty inquiry groups. But we do have more um, things going on right now having to do not with just reading apprenticeship, but with other student success initiatives at the college overall. So Henry and um, Ron, do you want to talk up and whoever was going to come up first and talk? Was it you, Henry? Um, and thank you very much to the panel and Jane for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Henry B. Ediot, for those of you who don't know me. And I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over some of the student support programs that we have here at College of San Mateo. And after I'm done, Ron Andrade and a couple of students are going to come up and share a little, share a little bit of information about our summer or pathway to a college program. So to begin, let me point out that as I'm going through some of these different programs, that uh, first of all, it's only a partial list. It's not a comprehensive list of all student support programs here at College of San Mateo. Uh, we need the whole afternoon to go into any degree of depth to describe the various programs. Uh, I think you'll see as I go through the uh, different programs that there are some commonalities. In addition, there are funding sources, both uh, what are known as categorical funds, state funds, uh, BSI funds, wide variety of funding sources for these programs. In addition, there are some programs that have been established here at CSM for a number of years. There are others that are brand new or, or that are going through a uh, kind of an initiation phase and that they haven't yet become institutionalized. And most of these uh, types of programs are those that are being funded by the basic skills initiatives. Uh, some programs are focused on specific uh, student populations. Uh, others uh, take a cohort model or an approach to a cohort model to our learning communities. And then a number of them do uh, integrate both instruction and student services, specifically counseling. First one, EOPS. And we have a couple of folks who work closely with our EOPS program, or a couple of counselors here. And they can correct me if I misstate or misrepresent uh, our EOPS program. But EO EOPS is a categorical program, meaning that the funding that comes from the state is very restricted. It has to abide by the guidelines that this funding provides. And there are a variety of services that are provided, including individualized counseling, priority registration, tutoring, workshops, computer lab and study area. Now students that participate in the program do have to meet various criteria and I don't know exactly what those criteria are other than they do have to attend full time. There may be a uh, socioeconomic uh, eligibility that they have to fall under. Uh, it's almost a like contractual kind of agreement. They do have to meet with the counselor a designated time. And the program itself in terms of the students that participate are very, very successful. And as Ruth can attest, each year at, uh, at a special uh, acknowledgement ceremony, there are a number of students who are transferring, who are graduating, who, who in one way or another have attained an educational goal here at the college. A related program is CalWORKS, and again, another categorical program that is funded uh, with specific uh, criteria in mind. And this is a program targeted uh, to individuals who are temporarily uh, in uh, receiving assistance, and particularly uh, individuals who, who may be defined as coming from needy families. Again, socioeconomic levels that uh, uh, allow them to participate, participate in this program and receive the services uh, provided by CalWORKS. Again, a list of the kinds of services that are provided uh, to the students in this program. Uh, I should have mentioned with EOP, we have almost 300 students participating in that program. In CalWORKS, it's a much smaller program. There are about 30 students participating. Another program is the Multicultural Center, which Sylvia is very much involved with. Uh, it is an institutionalized program in the sense that we have uh, counseling uh, available uh, for these students, bilingual, bicultural counselors, their support for AB 540 students and for foster youth. Everyone know what an AB 540 student is? Okay, these are individuals who are undocumented, who have attended uh, a California high school for at least three years and then graduated from a California high school. As such, uh, they uh, are eligible then to receive in-state uh, uh, tuition rates or enrollment rates. So they're, cons they're not considered a resident, but they pay resident rates for their uh, enrollment fees. 
and then of course foster youth, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, the multicultural center has also served as a safe zone for a number of different students. And as, as is promoted uh, in the multicultural literature, students of color, uh, LGBTQ students, foster youth, this is a place where they can come, where they can congregate and feel that they're in a safe environment where they're understood, where they can feel, uh, be with others like them and, and, and feel comfortable. Next, we have the Puente Project, which is a program that was uh, reinstituted uh, about a year ago. It's just started its second year here at CSM after about an eight or nine year hiatus. And we were able to bring back the Puente Program in part because of a grant uh, that was provided to the college. But again, outlined here are the various components of the program. It's a one year transfer focused learning community cohort model. You can see the classes that are paired together over that the, the two semesters, and then again some of the different services that are provided. And one of the important components of the program is that it does have, it does incorporate uh, enriching cultural activities including Noche de la Familia, which will be held in November of this semester. And many of the students in this program are first generation college students. So it's important that, that the families and the students come together so that they can understand, the parents can understand, the family can understand what it is that their children are doing here at the college. The Honors Project, again another program that's been uh, reinstituted, and I think in a, in a different kind of format uh, this, in this most recent uh, uh, incarceration, reincarnation. Uh, again, program highlights. Um, I think critical to the program this time around are the faculty mentors, are the kinds of research projects that the students are involved with, and also the fact that uh, the students have the opportunity to showcase their projects at Berkeley and or at Stanford, and then selected papers can be pu published in an online journal. In fact, uh, some of you may have received an email from David Laterman earlier today in which three, three of our students got uh, their, their papers published in this on, uh, online journal. Very quickly, let me read you the titles of the three papers that have been selected for publication. The first is Undocumented Workers, The Hidden Pillars of the Economy. Another one is Torn Apart, The Struggle for Reunification in Mixed Status immigrant families. And then the third one is For Better or For Worse, Questioning Marriage from a Queer Perspective. So three honor students having their papers published uh, here at, uh, in this particular journal. In addition, as I've mentioned, there are mentors involved uh, with, these, uh, with the work of these students. Manu is one of the mentors that, uh, uh, that worked with one of these students. Uh, motion is in two of them, yes, two of the three. Uh, motion is another one who uh, mentored one of the students uh, whose paper is being published. So I think a great uh, program to have back on campus. And I think it does provide that opportunity for students to really push themselves, to excel, and to really learn how to do research uh, projects. Ultimately then also the potential of getting them uh, published. Another unique uh, population that we serve here at CSM are our veterans. So through the Veterans Opportunity Resource Center, we provide a safe haven. Uh, again, a number of different services that are provided to these students to help them adjust. And some of the services listed here, like psychological services, tutoring, counseling, academic, academic advising, is offered on a very limited basis in the center itself. They can still access these services elsewhere at the Learning Center or at the Counseling Center, Psychological Services. But we found that many of the veteran students won't go, won't go to these different uh, locations to receive those services. So counseling, psychological services, some limited tutoring is held in the center itself. And so we're, we're trying to meet their needs by coming to that, that place where they feel safe. And uh, uh, it's proving to, to be a, a, a well receive service for our veteran students. Writing in 
the end zone is one of our well-established programs and very successful programs. It's just started a year nine here at College San Mateo. Uh, it is a learning community with a cohort model integrating both English and PE uh, in both uh, years of the program. A collaborative learning process, you know, provided academic <coughs> advising, personalized attention both in and out of the classroom which I think is a very key component in helping students to succeed. That whole personalized effort at many of our student, service, student services college. So writing in the end zone. Then our BSI program, which has been here at CSM about six or seven years now. And this is a list of some of the programs that uh, are being supported or have been supported over the last uh, several years. Uh, the SI program in math, which Lena Feynman has been working with, the BSI has been very generous in supporting this program. And in fact, this year, uh, approximately $50,000 is dedicated to the SI program. And uh, Lena has provided uh, documentation, data, collected data to demonstrate program is being effective, and that is why BSI is supporting it to the degree that it is. Of course, reading apprenticeship, you've heard today uh, more information about RA. Uh, BSI is providing some uh, support to this uh, endeavor as well. The Math 811 project, which Cheryl and Harry have been taking the lead on, and I know many other faculty are, are, are involved with that particular project that is being provided some funding as well. And something that we've been funding for several years now as well is the EOPS tours to Southern California universities, which group, uh, leads a group of 20 to 30 students each year down to, to Southern California to look at some of the schools, uh, the universities down, down south. Our learning center tutors uh, are funded we also are putting three units of release time for a professional development coordinator focusing on basic skills uh, in this particular endeavor. And then lastly, the Summer Bridge Program, which has evolved into the Pathway to College, uh, is being funded as well. So again, a partial list of these programs. And so, commonalities amongst all these different programs. In some cases, counseling and academic advising, personalized support, cohort models, safe zones, peer-to-peer -peer support, and then the integration of instruction and student services, all of which then support student success and excellence. So that's my overview of, uh, of a, a partial list of student uh, programs and services. This time, I want to turn it over to uh, unless there are any questions. Before I turn it over, seeing none, let me. That's my noon. Yeah. So, are there any psychological services particular to international students? Um, not specific to international students, but that's one of the programs I didn't highlight here. Is our international uh, uh, center? Um, we do have two dedicated staff for international students, but not dedicated in terms of counseling or psychological services. Thank you. I'd like to build upon that. So what services are available to these students? Because when I called or rather emailed up, I kind of got the, the uh, well, what you need. And I didn't know what to ask for. I'm like, what you got? I'm all happy. So, for international students? Yeah, I'm talking like about that. international students. And, you know, I was concerned, we were talking about it, I thought, well, let's find out. And kind of left empty-handed, so. For the most part, it's a referral service to counseling uh, to other departments on the campus. Uh, the, the center itself has computers. There's a couple staff who can uh, provide academic advising, uh, who can lend assistance, who can refer them to the, an, another department or an appropriate department. Um, for the most part, the center is uh, processing applications, admitting the students, ensuring that they're adhering to uh, the SEBUS regulations. In terms of being a full-time student, they have to be full-time because they're on, on a visa. Um, so in terms of direct services, there's not a, a whole lot that's being provided by the center.
center at this point in time. Henry, there, there's a couple of counselors that focus on international students for academic advising. So they're usually referred to more than those for right. academic counseling. And then Patty does other support programs for the students. Um, they have an international student um, club. student club and activities. She will probably start up last year. They have monthly events where they focus on different the cultures of different countries and got students involved. Um, so Patty, the coordinator, has uh, implemented that kind of student activities. Yes, that's right. We are finding that there are some students who are coming forth and saying that uh, they're not happy in the sense of they're feeling alienated or feeling alone. Yeah. The, majority, the majority of them succeed academically, but we're finding that there is this void that does exist for them. So there is some attempt to begin to try to address that uh, through the clubs, through other kinds of activity that will uh, get them involved like in student government. A couple of international students that are now uh, are senators with uh, associated students. But uh, there's the silent ones, the ones that aren't coming forward, that really need to be addressed. Well, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does sound like there might be some services, but it sounds like no one really has a good feel of what services are there. And maybe these need to be put down on paper and, and disseminated so everyone working knows lines of uh, communication. Yeah. And as well, identifying what the needs are for the students themselves. So, and in, in your point, making sure we know what uh, yeah. we can provide the faculty as they inquire about what is available, who can we refer students to. Anything else? Right, Ron, and the students. Quick overview of kind of what we did this summer with the revised summer bridge, which is now pathway to college, and uh, the scaffolding we did was supporting them with our new um, SMART, which is our, our peer mentor program. Okay. Yeah. Remember how to make this work? Yeah. Okay. And we just did that. All right. So here's a picture of our, our living group. Uh, we had 35 students apply to. Uh, be part of this program. They came in through this um, through the summer program. Thirty ended up enrolling, and twenty nine finished. We had one student who, who bailed out after a few days. It wasn't a good fit for him, which is which is okay. It's not bad to lose one uh, in a class of thirty. So we were pulling from we were pulling from students who placed into basic skills classes. So math eight eleven math. 110, English 828, and English 838. So that was the pool of students we were targeting. And we sent out uh, email messages to them. We sent out hard copy letters to them. Actually, I, I think I uh, sort of fooled them somewhat and, and addressed it to Ann Parents, so hoping that that might get it to be actually be open. <laughs> uh, so, because we were asking them to come to school for the summer, which I'm sure a lot of students are trying to avoid. So we did that, and there was even some follow-up phone calls for students who were kind of like, really, you know, what's it going to take to get you in here? So we worked pretty hard to get that, that group in. And the idea behind the program, you know, guys see very well, was to, we, we incorporated, kind of folded in some of the math boost stuff, which went away. So our, it definitely had a math focus. And we were talking about trying to make math fun and, and contextualize math for them. Um, Cheryl Gregory was our fabulous math instructor for those uh, activities and so we gave them things to do. Um, so they built little catapults and launched candy and they had to kind of measure mm -hmm. distance and arcs and kind of good stuff. So we kind of, math is not just something abstract on a piece of paper, you actually do stuff with it. Um, get them comfortable with college. So in addition to the math stuff, we had some students, kind of successful student aspects of it and then hopefully improve motivation and confidence so that they would have some confidence going through this program uh, and come out of it feeling energized and comfortable being here on campus. This is what their first week looked like. This was a two-week program. And we ran it in July, just after 4th of July weekend. And 
timing of that was actually a bit of a conversation about um, we do it too late in the summer, um, then you know, when they get to the end and they retake placement tests, well then they can't really switch classes because everything's <coughs> full. The students don't get out, some of them don't get out until June, and we don't want to immediately send them right back into school. So figuring out when to schedule this program was a little bit tricky. But um, every morning they got math. They did some sort of math activity to kind of interest and engage them. And then we had math tutors in the, in, in the program working with them on Alex, which is an online computerized um, math program. And it, they did an assessment about kind of where they were and what they already knew so that they could then just focus on the stuff that they didn't already know. And we were hoping that that would, and would these the tutors kind of coach them up to a level of math that they would then retake their placement tests and hopefully place higher at the end. Uh, several of the students, you know, they hadn't taken math their senior year, it had been a while, so it's not that they didn't necessarily know how to do it, so they had forgotten. So the idea was to kind of coach them along. And then the, they, they would take a break, and then later in the morning they would get um, either some English reading instruction, or they would spend time with me and the mentor working on just kind of college student success activities. So, and then the second week mirrored this until except the last Friday they had a chance to retake placement exams if they wanted to. And I think all but three of them actually did. Um, of those students who retook their placement exams, 15 improved their math placement by at least one level. And six of them actually moved up two. So um, it's, I think it came out to 55-ish like percent of the students ended up actually placing higher math, which uh, saves them time and money and all that kind of good stuff. So they were generally happy about that. Uh, they got the interaction with SMART. So SMART is student mentors assisting relevant transitions. And these are peer mentors who are here just to kind of help them on, you know, on that transition from high school to college and kind of figuring things out and um, also connecting them to CSM. So trying to get them link, looped into different activities and stuff on campus. So that's why we had students who had already been here a year or more and had, had some success who wanted to you know, help other students along. So SMART was uh, the mentoring program. We piloted it. We have seven peer mentors right now. And they each have uh, four mentees. So they're kind of uh, not spread too thin. Um, they are asked to reach out to their mentees twice a month. So it can be as simple as an email, a text, a phone call. We want them to touch twice a month. It's kind of, how's it going? Is there anything you're running into? Do you have any questions? And then you know, the bulk of the time that we spent training in the spring and summer was refer. When your students have a question about you know, how to go about accessing something, fantastic. Uh, but you're not academic advisors. You are there to refer them to the resources that they need. So we kind of really emphasize that. Um, we're very excited because mentoring seems to be something about hot topic at the moment. So in a couple of weeks, uh, Jennifer and I, uh, Jennifer Mendoza, Learning Center Director, sorry, uh, are heading out to actually make a presentation at a conference about our mentor program. So we got a, a conference proposal accepted, which was really neat. Um, and there's lots of conversation about how we can expand this to other populations. Um, one of them was, you know, can we hook it up and have international students? and um, other groups, and then the conversation is, well, is it, do we segregate them out, and have just international peer mentors, or do we want to mix them up? So um, lots of conversations about how this can scale up, possibly, and, and, and to whom. Um, there's, a very, there's a very ambitious request to have it for every incoming student, and we'll see what we can do about that. So, um, before I get to this, come on over. <laughs> Both of you, come on, Lenny. Okay, so um, I'll let you introduce yourselves, what your role in the program was, and I, I, I cheated, I gave them some little prompts to think about uh, before we got over here. So, please okay, share. Um, I'm Amanda Ado, and this is my first term at College of San Mateo, and I just moved here from Sacramento, so 
I was a student in the program, and I was one of the seniors that didn't take a math class. <laughs> so I went to take my assessment test, and I was like, I forgot how to do two plus two. Oh my gosh, what is going on? So I forgot how to do that, and it was just, um, it, was, it was easier to take the placement test again, and I moved up two math levels. So that's a lot. Good job. What do you think about having a, a mentor available? Oh, it's awesome. And if you don't contact them, they will literally track you down and stalk you. <laughs> and they make it a point to be with you. And I have Sarah Lowe. I don't know if you guys know Sarah. But um, she is awesome. And she gives you, like, so much confidence. And she helps you with, like, everything that you need. Like, even if it's, like, oh, I don't know where the bathroom is in Building 14. She'll be like, oh, third story. <laughs> so she helps with, like, pretty much any question that you have. I'm not Sarah Lowe. <laughs> um, my name is Eleni Jacobson, and this is my third semester at CSM. And uh, I'm a mentor, so I'm one of the smarties, as Ron likes to call us. Um, and uh, something that I sort of wanted to gain from the program was more of a connection with students who I might not get the chance to meet either because uh, we weren't taking classes together because they placed into lower English or math levels than I had. And I also wanted to. Um, like develop my leadership abilities, which is always important, I think. Um, and both of those things have definitely happened through the course of the program. And I think that, honestly, one of the greatest things about the Pathways program is the bridge that it builds between <coughs> students who are seen as the high achievers and students who are seen as the lower achievers. And it gives us a way to connect to each other without um, either you know the, the mentors seem, seeming condescending or the or the uh, mentees seeming um, needy or like they're you know, too desperate to ask for help or anything like that. It is a framework for us to uh, work together and cooperate to achieve the most student success possible. So at this point? What was the selection process for the attorneys? The <coughs> uh, they had to apply. <laughs> they had to offer, I'm trying to think what it was, they had to tell me why they wanted to be a mentor, what they thought were, they were going to get out of it, what experience they might have had being mentored. They needed two letters and of recommendation. And then they needed two letters of recommendation from somebody, yeah. usually you know, a faculty member or you know, a mentor who had already kind of helped them. And then that came to me, and I said, yes or no. Mostly yes. <laughs> and so you said we have seven. We have seven mentors, and, and you're going to ramp this up. Yes, that's, that's the, the plan. plan right? <laughs> the plan is to try and scale this up as much as right, we possibly right, can. Yeah. Uh, right. And part of you know, part of this is I'm actually paying my mentors um, nice. to do this, and if it scales up, I don't know where that comes from budget wise, but you know <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. I want to ask a question to the uh, pathways student. Yeah. Uh, when you, when they reached out to you, what happened? They sent a letter to say, "Would you like to do this?" Uh, by my mentor or from Ron? Like from before Ron. the class. Oh yeah, it was um, it was an email, and I think she sent two letters home. So one to me and one to my parents. And so there, my mom taped them up on my wall, and she said, "Okay, what is this?" So I put them up, and I said, "Hey, this could actually be like worthwhile. It's in the middle of summer, but hey, it'll probably help with something." So and it really did. So I was glad that I took the class. And that was my next question. What motivated you to put up your summer to take? <laughs> I didn't want to take two math classes because when I found out my scores, I was like, why am I in the lowest math possible? What is going on? I went up to Algebra 2 and now I can't even do basic elementary math. Um, so that's also something that motivated me. Was there housing provided for um, the students in the Pathways program? Did you uh, have to no. find your own housing in the summer? Or My grandma lives on Hillsdale, so she's like <laughs> there, so it was like really easy for me. <laughs> okay. Did we? Did we? Did other students have difficult? Were they just from the region? Uh, right? I mean, most of our students. They, they were from mostly area. from from local area. I mean, right. And you yeah. said you were from Sacramento. Yeah, I I planned on coming down here. I wanted okay. to go to San Francisco, like state. So then I was mm -hmm. like, okay, well, that is so expensive. So I'll just come get all my general stuff done here, and then I'll be like right next to San Francisco. Right. So, and I have a bunch of family down here, so. And yeah, my mom worked so. here, and my, a lot of students in town. Maybe, did you, did you know, I don't know if you asked, it was like, it was, it was a two-week period, right, for just in the mornings? Oh, so it wasn't like a, like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two weeks, we started you at 8.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Not really. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> they went until about 12, 12 30. For that two week period. Do you, do you still keep in touch with the other students? I do, actually. I actually made, I had knew nobody here, and they made it so safe in the program for you just to talk to anyone and pair you with different people that I actually have like four or five friends now that I do stuff with outside of school. Right, so you feel that it gave you like a, a big network yeah. right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So maybe I missed it. You said that you had wanted to ramp up the Smarties, the Princey mentors. Are you going to expand the program with Kelly <coughs> as well? That is all on the table. <laughs> Conversations about do we want to work with um, you know, international build uh, an international mentor cohort that they can then work with the international students, or do we just train a bunch of mentors and have it be an opt-in type of program? Right, when you want to mentor, then sign up and we prepare them. So um, all of that is just kind of still still being discussed. But yes, it, it will get bigger. Oh, and I ended up in class with Eleni, and she's not even my mentor, but I feel like I can just talk to her whenever, so that was also a good thing. It's not just you're with one mentor, it's with all of them. So. I do see lots of them spending time in the Learning Center together, um, which is which is nice. Yeah. You can see them coming in and out, and they come in and say hi and ask questions, and stuff like that. So I've gotten to know them as well. So what class are you in together? Econ. Okay. And how's that going? <laughs> we don't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they don't want to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> so Are you doing supplemental instruction with the econ class? This is a, is, is a it a Professor Lehigh's class? It or? is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Supplemental is that like tutoring? Yeah, in the um, Learning Resource Center, I know he's working. He actually with. just told us about that today. Yeah. Oh, so you're, you're just going to ramp up and start doing that soon, I think, right? It's a, well, it's optional for the... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So, so take advantage yeah. of it as soon as possible. Yeah, exactly. No, definitely. I'm going to do it. It really helped so a lot of students that. last semester, so... Yeah, 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 yeah I was really glad that we were introduced to the Learning Center right before we even came to our first class. So it's like, oh my gosh, first week, oh wait, I had a Learning Center that I <laughs> so I heard the bells chime. Um, it's mean it's four o'clock and it's Friday, so if Thank there's you. nothing else. Uh, and for those of you that are still here, we will be following up with the emails. And if you're interested in training uh, for RA or participating in the FIG, definitely contact us. Um, on, you know, I, I'm uh, Teresa Martin and myself, and we can see what we said. And take a bookmark on the way out and remind yourself. Uh, there's a different training, that online class is for the hour. There's a train on November 22nd, which is that day. And there are other workshops. I will see you.